that once upon a time were living in sin and did not know the Lord. They say, with all the worldly things, my heart was in accord. I had the gospel preached, so rugged, stained, and true. I turned and said, goodbye. Old world, I am true with you. And I believe this is the testimony of everyone that has truly come to Christ in Jesus' name. Again, I'll be talking on daily victory over besetting sin. When you give your life to Christ Jesus with a plan, desire, decision, and determination to follow the Lord, understand the enemy of your soul is not happy. And they would like to do everything possible to get at you and to bring you back to where you used to be. But in the name of Jesus, he will not get you. In Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 12, I look at it from verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, which doth so easily taunt us, which doth so easily come before us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradictions of sinners against himself. Let ye be weary and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Here we see the writer of the book of Hebrew telling us that no matter what we are going through, no matter the challenge, the temptation, the trial we are going through, that there were people that went through the same thing and maybe much more than what we are going through right now. And those people, they stood. Those people, they succeeded. They prevailed. They triumphed. And now they are with God in glory. And so we have and are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. A great cloud of witnesses. We heard about Enoch. He walked with God, and he was not. He was not because God took him. He walked with God in righteousness, in holiness, and purity, in the midst of the thickness of the darkness of his time. We heard about Abraham that was from the awe of the Chaldean, an idolatrous land. And God called him, Come out of your nation. Come out of your kindred. Come out of your people unto a land that I'm going to show you. And Abraham, without consulting with any flesh and blood, listen to the voice of the Lord, obey the voice of the Lord, did not say this is what my ancestors did. These are the gods they served my father and all the rest he took all and then he led he became the father of faith isaac jacob they followed after the steps of their father we had of david david the man after god's own heart the apostles were not left behind and so brethren we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. And in our own contemporary time, we have our father in the Lord, the general superintendent, 
that has been standing for the faith, that has been living for the Lord, and like John Wesley, who came up and discovered the doctrine and the teaching of sanctification, purity of God, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, he said, going by the scripture, in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 3, earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And that faith we have it. And we contend for it in Jesus' name. The Lord will help us. The Lord will keep us. Daily victory over besetting sin. The word besetting sin denotes, it means, sins that are often or constantly struggling with us. The sins that always come back to us, always struggling with us, and we are struggling with those things without clear evidence of victory over them. Without clear evidence of victory over them, that is the besetting sin. Besetting sin entangles and ensnares like a trap that easily captures an animal. You will not be another victim in Jesus' name. Besetting sin are like familiar spirit. And whenever you hear familiar spirits, you understand, it is a spirit that is familiar with you, that knows your in and out, your uprising and down sitting, your outgoing and your incoming in, and it's like it's part of your body. And now, this familiar spirit brings about weakness, brings about uh, the control over your life, your behavior, your conduct, your act attitude, and the activities of your life. That thing is evil, it's deadly, it's destructive. That is something you repented of before, that is something you said you let go before, and now you can see those things coming back into your life, besetting sin. It is a constant spiritual shortfall, inadequacy, or weakness that, if not urgently taken care of, can ruin the life of a man, somebody's life. And uh, talking about besetting sin again. It is the activeness of the nature of sin, the evidence of the still presence of the nature of sin, and the lack of genuine compassion, backsliding, or lack of total deliverance and the power of happiness. What I'm saying there is this. If there is a complete genuine compassion, you will be able to look at yourself and be able to say like Paul, it is no longer I that live it, but Christ that lives in me. And we'll be able to look at you and be able to say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It is one thing for you to know about God. It is one thing to you to know about prayer. It is one thing for you to know about reading the Bible. The devil knows all those also. The demons knows all those also. And so there is nothing new. What makes the difference between us and them is the new life in Christ Jesus. The Lord will give it unto you in the name of Jesus. And if you were genuinely converted before, and for what reason, what reason or the other, you have backslid him. The Lord is calling you back home to restoration. And that the resurrection power of Christ Jesus will come upon you and turn everything around in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 6. I look at it from verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Look at that statement. Dead indeed. Indeed, that is with assurance, definitely, without any gainsaying, 
without any iota of doubt. Reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the laws thereof. Neither ye ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have what? Dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. I pray that that grace will be sufficient unto you in Jesus' name. The Bible makes it clear unto us that without holiness, no man can see the law. Jesus further said that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. And so, when we are talking of the second sin, it means that if that thing is there, holiness is not there. And if holiness is there in your life, then be certain sin cannot be there in your life. You know, the problem and the challenge is because we are, many of us are religious. And we don't understand the clear distinction and difference between religion and righteousness. We think because I know about this, I know about that, I know about that. Uh, it's not about what you know. It's about the life that you're living, the life of holiness. And this holiness we're talking about, what is it about? It's a life of God that is free, completely free from sin, from all known sins. You are totally delivered from them. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, tells us, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsake them shall have mercy. So then, you don't just say you're religious. You repent of your sins. You confess them to the Lord, and then you renounce them. Mark that word, renounce. You renounce. You don't go back to those things anymore. The holiness is a life of uprightness of heart. In your thought, you're upright. In your desire, you're upright. In your actions, you are upright and pure. There should be no shady, dirty, crooked, or unrighteous thought hanging around you or on your heart. If you must be a holy man or an holy woman, holiness it's a life of pure conscience towards God and towards man. Herein do I exercise myself, that I might have a conscience void of offense, both towards God and towards man. Man may not know what is in your heart, but God knows. Man may not see, but God sees. Man may not be able to judge you, but God is the judge of the whole universe. And so be young, the recommendation of man, beyond the applause of man, beyond the commendation of man, go for the commendation of the Lord, who knows all things and will judge all things. Understand who shall dwell in the holy hill of the Lord is those that have uprightness of heart, no sin in their heart. Holiness, then, is a life that is clean in words, in thoughts, and in deeds. The Lord will help you, help me, and all of us to possess that life in Jesus' name. Holiness is a life that is full of happiness in the Lord, the joy of the Holy Ghost, the peace of the Lord. Holiness is a life of testimonial in righteousness and purity. It is a life that certainly brings glory to God. If your life, your action, your behavior does not glorify God, then it's short of holiness. It will bring holiness unto God 
and I pray that heaven will rejoice because of you in Jesus' name. First John chapter 5, I look at it from verse 4, verses 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, he will overcome. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The Christian life is a life of battle. The battle is not something we choose, but of which we have no choice over. The only way to run the race to the end is to keep fighting with the power of God and the grace of God for daily victory over self, over sin, and over Satan. Salvation from sin is the beginning of a lifelong journey of victory and dominion over the world. Look at me here. Look at me here. There is something I tell people about the conflicts of life, the battle of life. Let me bring the same thing back into this message on holiness, salvation, and freedom from sin. Because it's a life of battle. And you think, yes, because I'm born again, the temptation will not come. The temptation will come. But the grace to overcome is there with you. The strength to overcome is there with you. The power to overcome is there with you. Before you came out of your mother's womb, you engaged in a, in a battle. In a battle. And then you overcame that battle. This is what I'm saying. When the man is coming, when I say man, generic now, from the man to the woman, we're told they are coming in millions. You know what I'm talking about. And then when they are coming, the battle was already ongoing. I know some doctors may tell us that where conception takes place in the mother's womb, uh, conception takes place, so maturity or the embryo get life after certain weeks, after certain months. No. That thing coming from the man has life in it, right from the very beginning. And that is why they were swimming. Not only swimming, they were competing. And at that time, you overcome came all others that you competed with. You got to the egg first, so fertilize the egg. Pay attention. You were determined that time. And you overcame. Right in this time and age, with your determination, you will overcome again. You will overcome sin. You will overcome Satan. And God, pay attention here, what I just told you is science which the scientists themselves have not come to terms with. But let me come with the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Now you understand. Before you got into that womb, you have been existing. He said, I knew thee. I knew when, before, and when you took off that journey and began to run with all other people, and I knew at that time you were going to overcome. I knew at that time you were going to prevail. And so, before that time, I have called you. And I have ordained you, anointed you. Pay attention. Before you give your life to Christ, God knew. That you are going to serve him. That you are going to follow him. That you are going to live for him. That's why he picked you up like he picked Abraham from the midst of all the members of the family and all the people in his uh, country and said, come up, come out. He knew Abraham We believe and you will believe. You believe that holiness is a possibility. You believe that it is possible to live above sin, above tra transgression, above iniquity, above self, and above the world. And that grace God will give unto you in Jesus' name. I look at three points. Number one, victims of besetting sin and their impending doom. Victims of besetting sin and their impending doom. 
come back to that Hebrews chapter 12 again. Verse 1, we are poor. See, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Come back again. When you were coming from your father's body, you were going to your mother's body. What were you doing? You were running. And the Lord is saying, Now, from this mother earth to the kingdom of God, you are now in another race. At that time, you didn't allow anything to hang on to you, to weigh you down. You were focused, you were determined, you were speeding. And now he's saying unto us that we should lay aside, get rid of everything, no matter what those things may be, that are ways and the same that easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You will run successfully to the end. In Jesus' name, Hebrews 10, 38 tells us that now the just shall live by faith. But if any man drop back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition. I need an amen. And you will not draw back. In the name of Jesus, when you give your life to Christ, do everything possible to live like Christ, to talk like Christ, to walk like Christ, to serve like Christ, who gave up everything for the glory of the Father, who made himself available for the blessing of the world. Challenges were there, problems were there, oppositions were there, persecutions were there for Jesus, but then the Bible says, Yea, they that we godly live in Christ Jesus will do what? He will suffer persecution. And the persecution will come in different ways. May come in different form. But the grace to prevail, the Lord will give unto you in Jesus' name. The Bible tells us in Matthew 19:30 that uh, there are people that we force but we end up becoming the last. I pray that you will not come last in Jesus' name. That having started this race, and people are looking at you in front, and they're saying, good job, good job, good job. And all of a sudden, they find those people now at the bar, now crawling, now sitting, now uninterested, now discouraged. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Understand? The enemy is hauling his arrow, his spears, and bullets. But you will not be a victim. I say you will not be a victim in the name of Jesus. Because whoever has tasted of the blessings and the goodness and the glory of God and now go back into the world, it will be a sad, sad story. Even the unbelievers that never knew the Lord, when they meet with you in hell, they will make fun of you. They will say, Mr. Christian. They will say, Mrs. Holiness, we told you. Look at it now. In the world, we enjoyed ourselves. We drank. We smoked. We committed immorality. We lied. We did all the evil things. You didn't enjoy over there. And now you are suffering with us in hell. Just the running of your mouth will be hotter than the heat of hell. You will not end up in hell in Jesus' name. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. But if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandments 
delivered unto them, but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. I need a better one. No matter what you call besetting sin, maybe it's a little lie. Any little thing, you have told a lie. And say, oh God, forgive me, oh God, forgive me. Maybe it is stealing. Maybe it is lusting after the opposite sex. Maybe it is pornography. Maybe it is homosexuality. Whatever it is that you call a certain sin, I won't do it again, I won't do it again. Let me tell you this. Before I gave my life to Christ, I was already in the church. I was already ministering in a church. And I knew what sin was. But I had no power over it. And so I would tell myself, I won't lie again. Before I knew it, I had lied. I would tell myself, I won't do this, I won't do that. Before I knew it, I was into it again. I remember there was, there was a time I felt so bad with myself, and I slapped my mouth, and I said, you this mouth, you will not stop lying. I didn't know that it's not by power, that it's not by mind, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And then came one day, I went for a program, which I thought was going to help me to be better in preaching. Whenever I get to my turn again, they God saved my soul. And then I realized that only Jesus can save. And all my effort of struggling were gone. The power of sin was broken. In your life, it will be broken. And the law will make you to be completely and totally free from every sin in Jesus' name. You will not go back into sin. I say you will not go back to, into sin. In the name of Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. So, you don't want to toil with sin. You don't want to play with sin. You don't want to joke with sin. Because it will bring about a ruin and destruction to your life. First John chapter 3 verse 8. First John chapter 3 verse 8. Look up, look up here everybody. Look up here. I know you are trying to open. Look up here. Look up here. Wherever you are, look up. Whose child are you? Whose child are you? Are you a child of God or a child of the devil? Whose child are you? Let the scripture answer that for you. Now look at the Bible. First John chapter 3, verse 8. If you are there, just say amen. He, can we all read it together? Want to go. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Whosoever that commits sin, no matter the type of sin, the nature of sin, is of the devil. And that is why you don't want to just take things for granted. That is why you want to go before the Lord. Lay flat on your face. Go on your knees. Weep and wait before the Lord and tell the Lord, this nature of sin, take away from me. It may be your tongue, it may be your eyes, it may be your thought, it may be your environment, whatever it may be, and you say, Lord, except you bless me, I will not let you go. You know, these days, 
let me tell you about those days for us. Those days when we give our life to Christ and then we come to the church, we hear the word of God, we go on our knees and we pray. We don't look at time, that time. The prayer is over when we are over. And we weep, we wail. And we tarry over there. And we could tell the effect of it in the lives of the saints of them. Today, as soon as the church is over, and you hear, Amen. Everybody packs their bag. They are thinking about their job. They are thinking about that business. They are thinking about the person to talk with. The passion for prayer. The zeal for prayer. The grace for prayer is not there. Those of you that are over there on the other side of the sanctuary, the service is going on, I'm preaching, and I can see you talking. I don't appreciate that. I want everybody to concentrate on the Word of God. So we must ensure that our lives are in line with the Word of God. We are told, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Look at your life. Are there some old things that were there before? Maybe it's rebellion. Maybe it's stubbornness. Maybe it's self-will. Maybe I must, it's, I must have it my way. Maybe it is the struggle for position and for power. And you don't mind whose ox is good in order for you to get that position, to get that power, to get that title. And you don't understand that the devil was seeking to outstage God in heaven before his fall. And you think, yes, because I can still sing, because I can still teach or preach, because I can still do this or that. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. It says, behold, look at the conduct, behold. Look at the character, behold. Look at the language, behold. Look at the submission, behold. Look at the loyalty, behold. All things have become new. May it be so with you in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be healed, it is he to them that are lost. Pay attention. If all that we are preaching and teaching, and you still don't seem to know, you still don't seem to understand, you still don't seem to agree, and you think they are just holding us down, holding us down. The Bible is saying, if our gospel be healed, it is he to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world had blinded their minds, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, to shine unto them. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 10. I'll be looking at verses 10 through to 16. Isaiah chapter 29. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the 
and, and, as, and as close your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers had teeth covered, and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned. Say, read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learning, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learning. Wherefore, the Lord said, for as much as these people draw near me, with what? With their mouth. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. I'm an orchard, I'm a deacon, I'm a pastor. They draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me. But have removed their heart far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among these people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be, shall be healed. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their cancer from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And knew who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it be made now? Or shall the things framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. There are a lot of people in many places. So he's talking about their leaders, their pastors. The truth of the gospel is sealed from them. And here are you. You are looking at people whose hearts and minds and eyes have been blinded. And you are saying, there are Christians over there. This is the way they live. And they are Christians, the way they dress, provocative way. They are Christians, the way they talk. They are Christians, and they have boyfriend and girlfriend. They are Christians, you know, there is a particular person uh, that went to a place for deliverance, for prayer. And the person, the person to pray for him, was making advances uh, uh, for her rather was really making advances to her and the person said i had issue in my life i came for her and now they're trying to compound it and all they do praise the lord praise the lord the lord is good the lord is and then you are looking at all those outward shows without any evidence they have the form of godliness but denying the part therein the lord is saying that they are blinded and they are the people you are copying and imitating and the way they do the things they do the way they live their life the way they conduct their businesses and you think that's the right thing for you to do no it is not you need to come out of egypt and come to the light of the lord in jesus name amen amen now what causes besetting sin in the life of a believer because we're talking about somebody who claims to have known the lord claims to be following the lord serving the lord but then you still see some things in the life of that person maybe you're even a pastor you are pastoring other people but the life of god is lacking in you the grace of god is lacking in you uh, the strength to overcome sin is lacking in you you say you are a minister but you cannot be trusted with women. You cannot be trusted with money. You cannot be trusted with position. You cannot be trusted with power. The Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. What causes besetting sin? Let's quickly run through them. I have quite a few here. Number one, prioritizing carnality over spirituality. When you pay more attention to carnality over spirituality, and I have mentioned some of them already that to, uh, that, that to think uh, 
are important to you more than the will, the will of God, the word of God, the will of God, and the power of God. And you still lie, you still lost, you are still proud, you still gossip, you are still rebellious. Self will is there, anger is there, bitterness is there, unforgiving spirit is there, disobedient to parents, whether spiritual parents or biological parents, uh, is still there, and you are there, you undermine authority. And the Lord is saying, that's not the will of God. And you easily excuse yourself and try to explain all these things. From that alone, you prioritize your job over the work of the Lord. You prioritize your wife or your husband or your children or your possession or your work, your business or your education over the things of God, the spiritual matter. That is the second thing. Number two. Passion for recognition, position, power, wealth, riches, title, and success. You just want to be recognized. You just want to, I am in charge. I am the person. The Lord will help you in Jesus' name. You know, there are times, and pay attention. There is this person over there, that person over there, that worker over there. And you give instruction, he wants to do it his own way. And initially, I will feel it's a mistake you want to correct. And then you correct one time, you correct two times, and you see the person is acting in an obnoxious way. Uh, the person is just wanting to do it his own way. You know what I do? I leave you to yourself. I leave it to yourself. And uh, you just want to be uh, recognized. It's okay, even the devil is recognized, and we know him. So, when you are so passionate for that kind of recognition, not waiting for God to promote you, to lift you up, he said concerning Joshua, he said, Now will I begin to magnify you all Israel? If God does not magnify you and you magnify yourself, you will be destroyed. Amen. It is pride. It's an evidence of pride. Presence of pride. Number three, proximity to Sodom. The Sodom of the world. At war. The Sodom of the, of the world on the internet. You know the nude pictures you watch? All the bad things you watch? And you know the pornography you get into? Whether on TV or on the internet, whether within your family, the proximity to Sodom, the proximity to Sodom in your dressing, and pay attention, who are you trying to please? Mom or God? Who will have the final say over you? Don't you understand? The Bible makes us to know that favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But the woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. But you want to deck yourself like Jezebel. You want to deck yourself and tell the world that there is no concentration. There, was, there is no dedication. There is no absolute surrenderedness. And you don't understand that the slaves in those days that have been with their master when the time of liberty we are talking about the great liberation. May the Lord liberate you. When the time of liberation comes, the time of their freedom, and then their master say, go, I release you. And then the slave says, I am not going. I call them the slaves that love their chain. And then the master will take an all, a metal, an iron, all, and then bore their ear as a mark for anyone and everyone to see that this is a voluntary slave now. I had him captive before. I took him a slave before. I bought him as a slave. But now the time for him to go is there and he chooses and she chooses not to go. But as a man or as a woman, then the ear will be bored. Don't you know you still have the mark of slavery on you? And not just on your body now, but your. When will you be free? Be set in sin. 
May the Lord deliver you in Jesus' name. And then I knew you tell me that pastor is like that. And he preaches to the devil preaches to. Didn't the devil preach to Jesus and say that God has given his angels charge over him to deliver him? That he dashes his foot not against a stone? Wasn't that a good sermon? Wasn't that the Bible? But coming from the wrong corner. All it takes is for you to read and preach what you want to preach, live the way you want to live, but the Lord is talking to someone. Come out of Egypt. I said, come out of Egypt and give up all those worldliness that are still there in your heart in Jesus' name. Not those days when we give our lives to Christ, anything that is not of the Lord that we had before conversion, we get rid of them. Are there not some of you? You, came, you claim you have known the Lord for five years, for ten years, but all those bangles, jewelries, necklaces, chain, uh, you still have them. You say, well, if they won't let me wear them here in different life, I'll go and wear them elsewhere. No, we are not, we are not driving you away. You can wear them. You can wear them. It's just an indication of who you are. And it doesn't matter whether you're in deeper life or outside of deeper life. That does not change the position of God. Amen? That does not change the stand of God. The only thing is, on the other side, it will be too late. It will be too late. The people you have misled, by then, it will be too late. The people you have become a stumbling block to in their lives, it will be too late. For you to start repenting, to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And now is the accepted time. Today is a day of salvation. Daily victory over besetting sin. You are too close to Sodom. You are too close to the world. The worldly friends. The worldly business partners. The worldly movies. The worldly things. You are too close to them. And the Lord is saying, come out. That Sodom may be your colleagues at war. Colleagues at war. I know for a particular young man that was coming up well and doing very well in the faith. And then he got this good job, making good money. But because of proximity to the Sodom of colleagues, he got home one day drunk. Drunk drawn proximity proximity I pray the Lord will help you in Jesus name the Lord will help you in Jesus name proximity to the Sodom of ladies or of men of men and you're so close don't you know as a lady walking with a man you should be careful that you don't have this body contacts. That when, as a lady, your body is touching a man, you are igniting him. And then, before you know it, some talks and discussions will be coming up. And everything is going to begin with the Bible. The Bible. And it's going to sound okay and normal. Before you know it, you're going to end up on the bed. May the Lord deliver you in Jesus' name. If that work you are doing is not allowing you to be a real believer, you are burning in your body, why don't you ask your pastor, please redeploy me? You don't even have to explain the reason why. Why don't you say to yourself, I need to be out of this. If you can help that situation, whether as a man or as a lady, the Lord is saying, you need to do something about your life. It's not enough of you going back to prayer and saying, Oh God, I'm sorry, oh God, I'm sorry. Renounce that thing and quit from it completely in Jesus' name. Pleasantness of the world is another thing. Pleasantness. And that, uh, 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 the Bible proceeds the love of the world. 
but because I'm alliterating and I'm using letter P, a pleasantness also means love anyway. The pleasantness of the world, the pride of the world, the idol of the world, idol in the heart. It says, love not the world. First John chapter 2 verse 15. These are the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the loss of the flesh and the loss of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Then, pony yo, P U N Y, pony yo. Uh, the word pony stands for unequal yo, unequal yo. Again, we are told, First Corinthians chapter six, verse thirteen: Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? If you are in the light, let the light in you. The Bible says, let your light so shine. At where? I can't hear somebody. Before men, that they may see and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If you're a real child of God, and you're a Christian in that church, a Christian on that job, a Christian in that community, in that environment, let them see the glory of God. Let them see the beauty of heaven. There is a song we always sing. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All this wondrous compassion and beauty Oh, the Spirit divine of my nature in my till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. you. They do it, you want to do it. They say it, you want to say it. The next one is, uh, number six is provocative dressing. Provocative dressing. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 22 says, like a gold ring in a thick slot. It's a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. You see, you're a woman. You say you're beautiful, but there is no discretion about what is right and what is wrong. No discretion about what would please the Lord and what would displease the Lord. Outward beauty is foolishness. If a woman cannot discern what is or what is not appropriate dressing, a truly beautiful woman fears the Lord. And that is what makes Christian women attractive. I need an amen. I told you before, I'm going to say to you, Proverbs 31, 30, beauty, so favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But the woman that fears the law, she shall be praised. Number seven, pressure to feel the law, pressure, the pressure of the world. To go by the standard of the world, contrary to the standard of God, pressure pressure. The LGBTQ now, they say they have put clause. It's unlimited. And you're a Christian. You read it, you read it in the book of Genesis. The situation with the Sodomites. You read it in the book of Romans. Men defiling themselves with men. And you know, this is against the will, the plan, and the purpose of God. But because it is now the norm, the society is accepting it. And they're even trying to force other nations to embrace it. And you say, well, this is our world. We don't belong here. I say we don't belong here. We are pilgrims and strangers here in the world. The road to heaven is very narrow. 
very, very narrow. And if we must make it to heaven, we must live a different life from that of the world. Make it very clear. And that means you will not have many friends if you have any at all. You will not have many supporters if you have any at all. You have to make up your mind. Make up your mind so that you make it to eternal glory in Jesus' name. Peer pressure. As a youth, peer pressure. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. As an adult, peer pressure. Now, I'm looking at this pressure in a different way. You are a medical doctor. There are things doctors do. And because you want to flow with them, you know that thing is not right, but you do it anyway. You are a lawyer, an attorney. And you know there is an old saying that says lawyers are who? Liars. And then you say that is the nature of the profession. That is what God has called me into. God has not called you into lying, Mr. Lawyer. Mrs. Attorney. You don't go by that kind of pressure. And then you're a pastor. And let me tell you, pastors have a lot of pressure. And if you want to be known and recognized, you have this pressure. I can tell you, I've been around a lot of pastors, both Africans and Caucasians and different pastors. And they want to do it this way. You know, this is not the right thing. And they want to do it that way. You know, this is not the right thing. And then maybe you're even in their service in the congregation, and there are certain things you're doing, and uh, you have to ask yourself, do I really belong here? It's not a must for you to be with them. Amen? It's not a must for you to be with them. If they really want you, pay attention here. If you are that important to them, then they will be the one to condescend to your standard, to calm down. But when you are condescending to them, it means they are more important than the word of God, and God will help all of us together in Jesus' name. Um, uh, you are a prophet, you are a prophet, you are a pastor, you are a preacher. Um, they, you know, this time and age, a lot of pastors now, they want to prophesy. Am I right? They want to says the Lord, God says the Lord. When God has not spoken, and you made yourself a liar because many people are doing it, be certain sin. Your mind is what is telling you because of your position on this, your position on that. And you say, this is the Lord speaking. Now, don't we see the last election? A lot of pastors and preachers and prophets that have been known in the nation as the fathers of the Lamb for years that all their prophecies were false. Be careful. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not a jot or tittle of God's word will pass unfulfilled. Amen? And the Bible says that if any prophet prophesied and it didn't come to pass, then it's not of the Lord and they are false prophets. It shall be well with us. I said it shall be well with us in the name of Jesus. What causes the certain sin? I call it piggishness. I'm speaking a lot of grammar here today. Amen? Piggishness. What is piggishness? Covetousness. 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 I'll move on very quickly because of time. Then parry and music of the world. Parry. This time I need everybody wants to do birthday. And it's coming to deeper life. May the Lord help us. Everybody wants to celebrate everything. Celebrate everything. Celebrate everything. When last did you celebrate your, uh, your, uh, the date of your conversion? And your couple and say, come and rejoice with me. I've been in the Lord for the past 10 years. And by the grace of God, I'm still standing. Rejoice with me. 
rejoice with me. For the past 30 years, I've been following the Lord. I've been serving the Lord. Rejoice with me. Amen? And then you tell people, you know me. Speak against me. I'm not calling you to come and uh, commend me. And then you do thorough examination of yourself. The picnic of the world. Picnic of the world. Picnic of the world. Position and power. 